All righty, everybody. It's time for another episode of The Michael Shermer Show. I'm your host, as usual. This is brought to you by Skeptic Society and Skeptic Magazine. Here's our new issue. Just came out this week on artificial intelligence. Look at that cover. Is that a gorgeous cover or what? All done with artificial intelligence. <laughs> and now we can even include four color throughout. You can get your issue by going to skeptic.com slash magazine. Okay, my guest today, the returning champion, <laughs> Abigail Schreier. She received the Barbara Olson Award for Excellence in Independence in Journalism in 2021. This was based in part on her best-selling book, Irreversible Damage, and was named a best book by The Economist and The Times. It's been translated into 10 languages. In her new book, here it is, Bad Therapy, Why the Kids Aren't Growing Up. This has been the number one best-selling book on Amazon, even more than um, those diet books and the kids' books and all that stuff. Congratulations, Abigail. Thank you. <laughs> so I like that um, I, 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 iatrogenic uh, concept you introduce in, at the start of the book. Talk a little bit about that just as an introduction. Sure. Iatrogenesis is a Greek word for when the healer introduces harms. And we've long known that certainly in the field of medicine, through psychiatry, you know, every, all, all of these fields, anything that we've found that can help a patient, can even cure a patient, can also harm so, you know, an x-ray, you don't want to go undergo an x-ray if you don't need one because of the risk of radiation and, uh, and so forth. Same thing with Tylenol. Too much Tylenol can damage your liver. It's great for a headache, but, you know, you don't want too much of it. And, and yes, psychotherapy also comes with side effects. We know that. We know that burn victims who have uh, gone through uh, group therapy as opposed to the control group ended up sadder. We know that people who experienced a traumatic event sometimes end up with worse PTSD if they go to group therapy than if they don't. Uh, victims of normal bereavement, the loss, sometimes talking about it makes you feel worse about it. And that's true with amplifying worries, amplifying sadness, and, uh, and also undermining a sense of efficacy, like you can make a difference in the world. Um, and pr these are precisely the major uh, harms afflicting the rising generation. We're seeing the same symptoms in the rising generation that you get for over treatment. Yeah, I thought of um, the COVID shutdown of schools and restaurants and all that stuff that happened. You know, when it was done, it was like, well, what have we got to lose? The pa uh, the pandemic could be 10 percent, 20 percent deadly. Don't forget AIDS was 100 percent fatal at the start. You know, we don't want anything like that. And what's the harm of closing down schools? Well, Turns out there's a huge cost to pay for that. And, you know, I think policymakers, politicians, they don't think of it like that. Yeah. And, and frankly, you know, that's right. They don't. They don't think about it. They don't discuss it. And you see this, you know, with doctors, they have to. They're federally obligated to report the side effects of their medication or the reactions of drugs. But unfortunately, there's no such thing with in the field of psychology, with therapy, and um, you have a lot of practitioners out there who don't even know that talking to or certainly don't admit that talking to a teenager about what might be troubling her could lead her to feel worse about her life. Yeah. Yeah. Like in terms of the covid shutdown, I try to put myself in the shoes of a of the mayor, governor, president or the CDC head or whatever. And yeah. if it turns out it's like 10 percent fatal and you don't shut down the schools and you don't take drastic measures, then that's on you. So you, you kind of make the uh, uh, other calculation, like I'd rather risk shutting things down and who knows what the consequences will be rather than the, the one that could be deadly. So I'm thinking, you know, these schools, if they have a kid that commits suicide and, you know, it's, it's like a nuclear, we a, a nuclear accident. We, we have zero dollars for that. We cannot allow this to happen again, we have to do something. What can we do? Well, we better hire some psychologists and we better monitor every single kid just in case. Yeah, I mean, two things. One, you mentioned the lockdowns. You know, parents objected. Parents were very worried about putting teens through a second academic year of isolation. But the mental health establishment, and I'm talking here about the School Psychologists Association, School Counseling Association, the School Social Workers, they have an association. All of them were silent as we had it mm. into a second year of lockdowns. This was the most predictable, you know, harm psychologically to the kids. And now they're presenting themselves as the solution. Oh, let's talk about your problems. Well, their track record on that isn't very good either. Why do you think they were silent? 
why do I think they were silent? Oh, I think it was politically, you know, I, I think, you know, the school teachers really clearly wanted the, they did not want to go back to work. But at the very least, the school counselors association, the school psychologists, they owed us a warning. So we could at least temper all the enthusiasm for shutting schools down with some, hey, by the way, you could harm a lot of kids in the process. I mean, the fact that they didn't even say a word. Now, they did go to Congress. You know, the American Psychological Association did go to Congress to lecture Congress about systemic racism, climate change, uh, police tactics. They just had nothing to say about the foreseeable detriment to kids by shutting down another year of school. Yeah. Yeah, I guess it's uh, weighing the consequences of the different um, effects that happen down the road. Like in your previous book, you talked about, um, you know, trans kids threatening suicide to their parents. The famous line, do you want a dead daughter or a, or, or a, or a trans son or whatever, whatever, whatever the line was. And of course, no parent's going to say, well, I'll take the chance that my kid will kill himself. You, know, you just couldn't live with yourself. So you go the other direction, something like that. Is That's a calculation. Right. And, yeah. And remember, it was psychologists saying that or it was it was therapists saying that they were the ones saying that line to parents and strong arming them. And I think they're doing the same now. You don't want your child not to have a diagnosis and medication. I mean, if you know, we're seeing this, it could be depression and you want to immediately get in there with an SSRI. And I think they're vastly over diagnosing these kids without any sense that diagnosing a kid in itself is a serious intervention. You're going to change that child's self-concept. So I'm not saying never do it. Of course, if you need to, you need to. But if you don't, you don't throw around diagnosis for a kid who may or may not have, you know, an anxiety disorder. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know how much you follow Jordan Peterson's career, but he he's become a friend and colleague, and I, I've just watched with just a kind of startling uh, awareness of uh, the message he's giving, which is so basic, and, and these kids are just like glomming onto this. I remember when I first went to see him live, it, it you know, just basic stuff like set goals and work out, eat right, make your bed. It's like really? No one's ever told you this? I mean, this is really kind of like 101 to life. You know, I think ta Jordan Peterson's amazing. I think he's tapped into something so elemental and important. And what you said is right. No one's telling them these things. See, what they're telling them is you have social anxiety. You may need to start a medication. But what they're not mm -hmm. telling them is go join a sports team, put down the iPad, go play sports. You'll feel better uh, because we know exercise does more to reduce, you know, sim you know, symptoms of mild to moderate depression than than psychotherapy or medication. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, to me, your book is could have been titled "Bad Therapy, Bad Parenting." <laughs> both. <laughs> it's a little bit of both. Yeah, I think that a lot of the solutions you can't implement if you put, you know, mental health experts in charge of your child rearing. You need to be able to say, "Listen, I'm your mom. I know best," or "I'm your father. I know best." this is what we're going to do. And if you can't sort of set the guardrails for your kid, you're leaving them prey to a lot of other people who are going to come in and make up the rules for your kid. And that's, we're seeing that with the activists. And I think we're also seeing that with, with some of the therapists as well. Yeah. Yeah. When I was reading your book, I went to pick up my kid from school. He's seven. So second grade. And uh, cause you were talking about, you know, just kids say just crazy shit. And then, you know, it, and parents just go, yeah, yeah, whatever. But the therapist at school, like, oh my God, do you know what he said? We have to talk yeah. about this anyway. So uh, we just uh, put him in a new Montessori school here in Santa Barbara and he's having a little adjustment and missing some of his friends at the old school. It's anyway, long story. So he's been kind of getting more and more used to it. So, you know, he gets in the car, I go, so how, how did it go today? It was like, oh, it was pretty good. And I said, on a scale of one to 10, 10 being best, how was your day today? Oh, it was a 10. I'm like, oh, thank God. Oh, this is great. <laughs> and then his mom calls and, and, and she says, you know, how, how, how was it today? He goes, terrible. It was horrible. I said, you just told me it was a 10. He said, well, I thought 10 meant the worst. I said, no, you didn't. <laughs> and then he's like, and then she's like, oh, come on. He's like, oh, never mind. Because <laughs> they want just, sympathy from mom. He knows he's uh, going to uh, get sympathy from mom. Yeah, <laughs> who knows? They're just, they just say shit. And yeah, you know, most of it you could just sort of blow off instead of looking for some deep meaning. Right. So a lot of it is like deep root cause-ism. What's the deep root cause of whatever? And often it's just random shit that happens from day to day. It's like um, I was reminded while reading your book of that uh, Ellen DeGeneres riff on 
uh, those commercials for antidepressants and anti-anxiety medications. Like, do you ever feel sad? Are you ever anxious about anything? And she goes, yeah, I'm alive. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's right. And unfortunately, see, with adults, there's, there's this natural vetting process or this natural triage where we know what we should ignore, what we can brush off and what we can move on from. We have a history of ourselves, right? We know if this is, look, I'm feeling blue, but I've been through breakups before. But kids don't know that. Kids and teenagers don't know those things. So when we throw them into a kind of counseling or therapy or emotions discussion, they have no way they, they, they will take the adult's lead. And this can often lead them to really magnify minor distress um, and and also also inevitably it leads to the conclusion that the parent is to blame. After all, they're the ones in charge of keeping you safe. Yeah. Okay. So your book is addressing a problem to be solved. Is there really a problem? Is the data really reflecting something that's happening in society? That is the spike since about 2015, three times as much as girls, one and a half times as boys of suicidal ideation, depression, anxiety, cutting anorexia and so on and so forth. That That's real, right? You're pretty confident. Well, right? here's what I'm most confident in from those numbers, because there's no question there's an exaggeration in diagnosis. Okay. Here's what I'm, we are talking about our distress. The young kids are talking about their distress more than ever before mm. and ruminating on their bad feelings. And that itself is a symptom of depression sitting mm. around thinking that you're sad and you're feeling bad and rehearsing in a loop your sadness, that itself is a symptom. So we know that these kids are in a bad place. Um, and we know, I think, that the mental health experts in general that they're in encountering are not helping. I think mm -hmm. they're hurting, but, but mm -hmm. at the very least, we know they're not helping. Mm -hmm. Right. So we follow this debate on the show with you know uh, Jonathan Haidt and, and Greg Lukianoff. Yeah blaming social media, screen time, Facebook, and all that stuff. And I'm not 100% convinced of that. I, I like your approach also, the parenting thing. Uh, I had uh, Jean Twangy on the show oh, talking about great. generations. And she presents her theory of you know life history theory. And, and so our listeners are not familiar with this, um, that thanks to life-saving technologies, public health, vaccines, and so on, people are living a lot longer, twice as long yeah. as they used to live. So the develop, unfolding of your life can go slower. You don't need to have kids as early. You don't need to have kids as often. And she had a startling statistic that women today uh, are 10 years later than they were my generation, baby boomers. In other words, it was, I think, age 19 was the average first pregnancy for a, a baby boomer woman, and now it's 29. It's a whole decade slower. And instead of having three or four, 2.5 or whatever, now they have one. So her theory was that when you only have one, you become highly risk averse. Yes. And therefore, the it's not coddling in a negative way. It's just like, that's the only one I got. I have to put everything into it. Right. It's a little bit like, you know, in evolutionary theory, there's our selected case selected species. So our selected rapid, like salmon, you know, you have 100,000 eggs and you hope one gets all the way to the top of the stream. Right. Uh, uh, our case selected, like elephants, you just have one or two. And you got to put all your resources into them to make sure they make it to reproductive age and so on. So that, that kind of risk aversion factors into how much you allow your, in this case, kid to, to be a free range kid and run around in the playground and take the, like Lenore Skenazy did, you know, take the subway to school or back. And, you know, for that, um, you know, times have changed on that. So what are your thoughts on what's the cause of this whole problem and how do you tease apart those different causal vectors? Right. So I love that. What you just said about Jean Twenge. I love Jean Twenge. I've interviewed her. I profiled her for the Wall Street Journal and love, loved her book. I would say this. My explanation for what she's seeing and documenting, why aren't these, why are these kids taking so long to grow up? And, and then, of course, my other question is, why are they in such distress? So she's right. They're taking a long time to grow up. They're delaying these things. And my, my, you know, what I argue in the book is those two questions are related. Why are they so miserable? Because actually the cure to most of their adolescent angst is growing up, by mm. which I mean taking on responsibilities, becoming a load-bearing load wall, being someone other people can depend on. That's actually the cure for the lot of, a lot of the sort of teenage fantods and, mm. and, and general angst. Teenage what? 
fan tods, you know, the worries, all the fears. And oh, uh, I've never I, heard that. Term. Oh, I, I try to avoid saying anxiety because we, uh, oh. you know, we constantly talk about anxiety as, oh, it's my anxiety. We talk our way into, you know, what, what we used to just call worry or fear or nervousness. We now diagnose all the time. And, and yeah. really, uh, it's just it's too much. We have we have people in the streets and all kinds of people who really do suffer with severe, diag you know, disorder and, and other things. But but the idea that we're all walking around with, you know, this well of anxiety is just it's not a helpful way of looking at it. Right. So uh, because of entropy and the second law of thermodynamics, there's far more ways for things to go bad than go good. Life is hard. It's, it, you know, every single day could be a bad day. So you just have to get up and face it. And what you're saying is that obsessing about the ways things could go wrong could be self-fulfilling rather than pushing forward and say, well, if I get just, I know bad things, but I'm going to set my goals and just go and just buffer it and be anti-fragile. Um, and, and so on that, that's the way to do it. I mean, that's exactly right. I can quote studies, but also, but, but let's just think about our grandparents. We don't need the studies. Just think about your own grandparents, what they survived, what they made, what they persevered through and that they never expected to be happy. They didn't think they were owed mm. happiness or entertainment mm. every day. They, I, I, you know, I talk in my book about my own grandmother who, you know, grew up mm -hmm. poor through the Great Depression that she spent a year a in an story. iron lung, after, you know, surviving polo, polio. Her mother died in childbirth and she never occurred to her she was supposed to be happy all the time. And truly to the end of her life in her 90s, she was the most positive, happy person I've known. <laughs> yeah, I think it's been my constant complaint. Happiness is the wrong word or the wrong goal. You know, it should be leading a purposeful, meaningful life, yeah. which which means having challenges in which you're not happy doing them. Right. <laughs> the examples I use, you know, being a caretaker for two of my four parents. My parents were divorced when I was young and so I had two step parents. Anyway, so I took care of two of the four of them and it wasn't fun. I wasn't happy doing it. But, you know, afterwards I felt like, well, you know, that's the right thing to do. I feel good doing it. I'd want somebody to do that for me. They did these wonderful things for me and so on. It was just sort of this is part of life and it's good. Uh, it, but if happiness was my goal, I wouldn't have done it. <laughs> right. I mean, it's it's funny. You know, I think about my own kids, you know, naturally. And one of the things I, you know, I only learned this through while I was writing the book. But what you just said is totally right. Getting a purpose and doing something for the common good, taking care of, you know, parents and grandparents actually, you know, can be very rewarding. It's very rewarding. And I'll give you an example. You know, we, we celebrate this Jewish holiday called Sukkot, where you're supposed to build these little huts in the, uh, and, um, and, and live in them in the, in the fall. And for a week, basically, I mean, you have your meals and then whatever. And we sent my son, my, my, my mother-in-law and father-in-law needed help because they're getting older building theirs. And we mm. sent my sons over to build it for them. And they, of course, you know, grumble or whatever, but they get over there and they're, when they're done, they're so happy. Why? Because with, with rods and tools and metal, you know, metal poles and all these things, they had built this structure that was needed by the family. And those things are so gratifying and we don't give kids enough opportunities to do things like that. Yeah. Yeah. I remember reading uh, Dan Gilbert's book, Stumbling on Happiness, and he had that research in there about how having children makes parents less happy. And I remember thinking, it, well, so then what's the answer to this? Don't have kids. It'll be one of these, what do they call them? Do, two, double income, no kids, dinkos. It, but, but if you're having kids to be happy, that that's the wrong reason. You, that's not why you do it. You do it because it's fulfilling. It's the best thing you'll ever do and on and on and on. Uh, you know, again, wrong goal. Yeah, we're not very good at sort of knowing what we need when it comes, you know, psychologically. I mean, think about it. You know, you, you go through a breakup. What do you want to do if you're a woman? You know, especially women, you want to talk about it endlessly. But the advantage is, you know, you complain and complain to your friends is very natural. Most women have this experience at some point. And at some point, your friends basically let you know, I'm done hearing about this. It's time to move on. And that's actually really good advice. That's actually really mm -hmm. good for us. And the problem is when we send a child off to therapy, no one's going to tell them it's time to move on. He dumped you in the seventh grade. It's not the biggest deal in the world. And you're never going to get that signal from the therapist and the child's not going to know it. So now you've got years and years of rehashing the same, you know, injury. Yeah. Yeah. I've done some 
counseling and therapy with, for marital with my first marriage that, that broke up after 20 years. You know, so we tried for a few years of this and, you, you know, 225 bucks an hour and, you know, kind of dev- dissolved into this just complaint session. Like, you know, well, you know what he did this week? I'll tell you what she did this week. You know, each had our little list. I thought, you know, I could do this for free with my cycling buddies when I'm out. You know what my wife did? <laughs> and it's like, what, you know, what's the end game here? Right. So you talk about this. What's the goal of therapy? And do they have goals? Well, obviously the best therapists do. I mean, you know, when they're, for, for two, two things. One with adults, okay, which is a separate category. Adults can decide what they want. Some adults might just want someone to talk to once a week forever. Mm. And that's fine too. Some people might find mm. that use, useful and they need it. Good for them. But with with children, you really, who can't push back on a therapist, who aren't likely to say, hey, I've been doing this for two years, nothing's working. A kid can't say that, right? They can't know mm. it. But so they're not in a position to cut it off if it's not helping or if it's counterproductive. Um, and, and with, with them, it's more of a concern because that they're during the therapy, they can get more upset about their own lives. They can, they can absolutely get more upset with their parents. And we're seeing that, you know, this whole phenomenon of parental estrangement, there's no question we've, we've seen the record levels of that in the rising generation. And the, the man I interviewed about this is an expert in it. Uh, his name is Joshua Coleman. He's a psycho, you know, a psychologist. He's written several books on the topic. But Hills tells me that he told me that the number one cause of parental estrangement, the rising generation, young people deciding they're cutting off their parents because their parents are toxic, supposedly, um, is the therapist that they, they went to see. Mm. Quack therapist, I would say. I, I think that's fair. I really do. It's I just irresponsible. It and I've talked to so many wonderful therapists who say to me, no, I'm there to deal with a problem. And I make sure and we talk about, is it getting better? And we tell them. You know, we limit the number of sessions with a child. You don't let it go on forever. I mean, these are responsible practices by really good, you know, therapists. Yeah. I bring that up because I have some institutional memory on this uh, issue uh, in Skeptic. Here are some of the um, quack psychotherapy and theories we've debunked over the decades. A subliminal messages scare, the satanic panic, the recovered memory mania, the self-esteem movement, multiple personality craze, the left brain, right brain fad, the Mozart effect, You're supposed to play Mozart when your child's in the womb, <laughs> the vaccine autism fear, super predators fear, uh, fear, that was in the early 90s, attachment therapy, the drug abuse resistance education, the D.A.R.E. program, you talk about this in your book, that increased teen drug use, the scared straight program that made adolescents more likely to offend, the critical incident stress debriefing, CISD program, that worsened anxiety and symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder and many more that have plagued psychology and psychiatry. It's astonishing to me in our profession that this, it just seems like every five to 10 years or so, there's some new fad thing that it takes really experimentalists and lawyers ultimately <laughs> to kind of bring an end to it. Uh, it's astonishing. And gender dysphoria, the tr- convincing a whole, gender dysphoria, all these yes. teenagers right. that they were transgender, these teenage girls who couldn't possibly have had gender dysphoria. I mean, yeah, that's right. And, and, and of course, the problem isn't that they aren't useful or can never be useful or that there, there's no place for therapy. It's that no one's tracking side effects. In fact, a lot of the you know, practitioners, a lot of the clinical therapists don't even acknowledge that it could harm a patient. They think and they will say talking about your problems is always the solution or it's always going to improve things and make it better. That isn't true. It's never been true. Uh, um, yeah. and again, with adults, it's one thing an adult can say, listen, I, I know, I know we seem to be blaming my mom, but I, I don't think it's fair to call her toxic. Uh, but, but mm-hmm. a teenager is not going to say that. Yeah. 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 I met a mom, I don't know, about a year ago. So told me her 13 year old daughter has come out as bisexual right. by which she means she likes boys and girls. I said, Oh, she's having sex and she's tried both. No, she's not having sex with anybody. Right. I said, well, then how does she know? Oh, it's, you know, it's up here. Right. It's like, what are you talking about? Yeah. And that's, that's sort of the intersection of those two things you brought up. You said to me, your book could have been called, you know, the problem with therapy and the problem with parenting. And they, they do go together. When a parent turns over their child to a therapist and says, well, you sort it out. Transgender identity could have been one of the things they explore. In other words, they're mm-hmm. just sitting around fishing in the child's brain very often. 
And if there isn't a problem, if they're not working on the child's severe, you know, anorexia or any a number of, of disorders that the child desperately needs work to work on, then they're just really sitting there for a rap session. And the adult has so much power, um, even inadvertently, mm-hmm. she can suggest things, uh, you know, and, and lead a kid down the wrong path. Right. Again, memory is not a recording device uh, in which you replay the scene on the uh, Cartesian theater of your mind and the little homunculus reports what's on there. <laughs> uh, I'm glad to see you interviewed Elizabeth Loftus. She's a longtime good oh, friend. She's amazing. And, yeah, that was a, it's, it's astonishing yeah. that it was the, it wasn't until the 19 late 1990s, thanks in part to the recovered memory movement that it took to debunk all that nonsense. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we just have our our intuitions are really wrong about about a lot of human psychology. So our intuitions that our memories are this perfect re- recording device. No, they're not. As you just said, they're more like Wikipedia pages. Elizabeth Loftus has called it. So anyone yeah. can up, you know, other people can update your memory and alter it, and you can alter it too. And um, you know, the recovered memory epidemic that was a series of therapists who suggested and implanted the idea that kids had been abused, and they were they began to remember the abuse. And here's the thing: your memory of abuse is not different. Your your even if it's false, it, it's it's no less veridical than an accurate memory. So when when we're in there, you know, fishing for trauma with kids, as school teachers are now today, and school counselors are today. Um, they're they're very likely to turn up something, even something that is didn't happen. No Holocaust survivor ever repressed the memory of what they went through. This is, just doesn't happen. And when we pointed that out back in the nineties, their response was, "Well, sex sex abuse is different than genocide or being gassed." It's like, oh, really? Okay. <laughs> but you know, how did that unfold? So we published in Skeptic a um, an account by one of these women that went through this. So she went in her late twenties. She was suffering from whatever depression, anxiety, the usual just uh, problems, and goes to see this therapist who says, "Well, do you think was there any like sexual abuse in your childhood?" She goes, "Goodness, no, no, no. I, I know, I know you don't think there was, <laughs> but a lot of my patients find out that they were. Now, maybe you weren't. You know, who knows? But but here, here's a book. I forget which. I think you cited the the book in your in your book." Uh, you know, read this and think about it and think about your dreams. Right. Do you ever have any dreams where these images come up? Well, maybe. Right. Anyway, six months later, you know, oh, yeah, my father sexually abused me and my mom was complicit and the sisters and brothers knew about it and so on. And but she ended up getting a lawyer and suing the right. therapist um, after ruining the lives of her family. Right. I mean, and there was, you know, dozens of cases like this that were just horrible. That's right. I mean, the. the... <laughs> The power of suggestion, especially with children and teenagers, they're going through so much. It's so strong. You don't need much to lead a child down a wrong path. And that's why I'm saying, like, you know, unless a kid has a real problem, look, if they sit around with a family member, right, an aunt, a grandparent, usually not only does the person love them, not only do they want what's best for them, but they have no incentive to keep these sessions going forever. But with a therapist, the incentives are all wrong and there's no one overseeing it to make sure that the child's actually improving and no one's measuring are there harmful side effects like alienation from mom. You know, PTSD is apparently a real thing and stress does have effects on the body. So what do we know and what don't we know about that? Sure. So we know things like... um, combat vets who succumb to PTSD, I mean, they develop, they go through a traumatic experience and seem to develop the symptoms of PTSD. They may have, there's some indication that they may have slightly different brain structures. That's possible. Okay. But here's what we don't know at all. We don't know whether the traumatic event caused the brain difference, whether the brain difference made them susceptible Mm. to succumbing to PTSD. And that's true across the board of all kinds of different physical symptoms of uh, traumatic events. Because we do know, and the wonderful work of George Panano has shown this, that most people will be resilient even in the face of, of traumatic event. Most soldiers, combat vets, don't get PTSD. They actually recover uh, remarkably. We're actually built to recover. Now, some people don't. Some people have a harder time, and we don't know why. 
But here's what we definitely don't know. We don't know that traumatic events change your body or your brain. We don't know it causally because they haven't done prospective mm. studies that would establish that. And we definitely don't know that you can reason from combat veterans to elementary school kids who, whose parents got a divorce. We don't know anything about the brains of such a child based on the combat vets who suffered PTSD for many reasons. Aside from the fact that children, like adults, are most likely to be resilient in the face of all kinds of traumatic event, but also we don't know because actually a sudden shock is totally different from a grinding, um, you know, period of abuse or sadness, because we tend to actually kids and people in general tend to habituate to the sort of slow moving sadness of say parents breaking up. Um, but but a traumatic event, you see your buddy mm. explode. That's a different kind of brain right. so event. So it's the the counterfactuals we have to look at. Um, children who uh, grow up and become abusive parents, we think, well, were they abused? Oh, they were abused. Oh, well, that's the cause. Okay, how many children were abused as children and grew up and they became anything but abusive parents? They're exceptionally loving because they would never want that to happen to their own. Uh, and so on. And, and so it's the counterexamples we have to look at. Well, also, yeah, Kathy Whiteham, actually, those, those studies, the idea that every person who, you know, is traumatized in some way or has psychopathology, they were abused as adults. Well, that's never been, uh, sorry, they, they went, they were abused as mm -hmm. children. They've never established that through prospective studies. And the researcher who did the best work in this area is Kathy Whiteham. And she did, she did prospective studies, meaning she looked at the kids who had gone through something like childhood abuse and saw that it was documented. She then followed up with them 10, 15 years later and sent in blind researchers, researchers who were blinded to not, meaning they didn't know which of the kids had suffered actual abuse and which hadn't. And what she found was, that the kids who had suffered abuse as children were no more likely to physically abuse their own children as adults that the, than those who hadn't. But she has a more recent study, which is to me even more interesting. It just came out, I think a month ago. And, and that is that if you're an adult who believes you were, you, who has a current psychopathology, a certain current mental health problem or difficulty in life, like making emotional connections or forming relationships, you are more likely to, you are more likely to um, believe that you had a childhood in abuse than those who actually uh, I'm sorry I'm saying this wrong if you have an adult psychopathology um yeah, yeah. sorry it's hard to keep track let of me those. Just, let, let me <laughs> let me make sure I'm getting this right um those who, oh sorry those adults this is it the Kathy Whiteham's new study is the following those adults who believed they were traumatized as children are more likely to exhibit adult psychopathology than the adults who went through oh. actually traumatic in incident incidents as children wow. and didn't regard it as trauma. Not regarding it as trauma is bet it meant wow. coincides with That's better amazing. mental health as adults. Yeah. So the again, the consequences of believing something happened to you when it didn't is not trivial. Here, I was th thinking in the story you tell in the book about. Right. Uh, with one of your boys and the counselor came in and said, I'd like you to leave the room now so that we can do some psych test or whatever. And you didn't. Thank God you didn't, because <laughs> that's where the bad things happen. We learned this from the um, from the McMartin preschool case. That was the longest, most expensive trial in California history till the OJ trial. And uh, this was a, a, a case where the police took these children aside away from their parents. So, and these are like uh, grammar school kids. So they're scared to death. Like, well, where's my mom? You can see your mom in a moment, but first we're going to show you these anatomically correct dolls. Right. Now you tell us where the teacher touched you here on the doll. You point to the doll and, and the, it, basically the kids just stumbling around. What do I got to say to get out of this room? <laughs> and so, and that's how the whole thing unfolded. And right. so it became clear after that, you know, interviewing techniques were d being done all wrong. And we're doing this to kids. It's like what happened to, you know, I, I tell that story in my book where I just took my son in for, to an urgent care clinic for a stomach ache because it wasn't going away. And I thought maybe he'd picked up a bug at summer camp or something. And uh, they, they cleared him. They said it was just dehydration. They were going to send us home. And they said, now we'd like you to leave the room because 
we're doing our mental health screener. And I almost left the room, but I had already written the book. So I said, hold on, let me see your mental health screen. I can't believe I got up to leave the, you know, I had just written the book and even I get up to leave the room because when a person in scrubs asked me to do something, I usually just do it. And it was put out by, it was a survey put out by the National Institute of Mental Health. This is a federal government agency and they, it's, it's mandated for kids eight and eight and up. And they asked the parents to leave the room. That's part of the protocol. And then they asked them five escalating questions about whether that child may want to be, may want to kill yeah, himself. Astonishing. Oh, I was thinking about um, back back to the abuse of uh, parents or ch- children. You know, it's a signal detection problem. This is one of the last columns I wrote for Scientific American before they canceled it. Was uh, I told a story about doing a documentary on cursed horror films? So these are horror films where something bad happened to the cast, like The Exorcist and some of these other famous films. And anyway, so they had examples of this. Oh. I said, okay, what about the the horror films where nothing bad happened to the cast. Oh, I, we don't, I don't know anything about those. Okay. Well, what about the non horror films where something bad happened to like Superman with Christopher Reeves breaks his neck. And so, Oh, I don't know about those. It was like, right. I mean, what, what are we even talking about? Right. So you get the two by two grid, one, two, three, four cells, you know, we're interested in the two cells, the one where bad things do happen to the course, or they don't. And then the other two, uh, false positive, false negatives, and so on. Anyway, so that part of the column was fine. But then I said, I used the example, uh, because Carol Tavers had told me about this this study, I think it was one you cited, about, you know, abusive parents who were abused as children. Okay, what about the abusive parents who who were not abused as children? What about the abused children who did not grow up to be? And and my editor said, well, we can't we can't say that because you're discounting the pain that people who were abused as children. It's like, no, I'm not. It's nothing to do with what somebody feels. It's just we just want to know, does it have this causal effect or doesn't it? Brilliant. And people don't obviously I mean, uh, obviously, you're, you're, you you know, more than you need way more than I know about this stuff. But that yeah. they're all beset by selection bias, as you were saying. Right. And it's the same is true with these studies that purport yeah. to show intergenerational trauma. They look at the, the kids of people who survived the Holocaust. So already you're dealing with a particular subset of humanity, the tiny number that survived. You're not looking at everybody. And now you're saying, okay, are their kids a little different? Well, we don't know if they have, if the reason this group survived is that they all have heightened anxiety or heightened awareness of danger. Maybe there are things that are different about them. But second of all, there's no proof that that what was passed on was passed on, you know, through epigenetic transmission. It may just be they scared the daylights out of their kids by telling them the stories of what they went through which is also, you know, very believable and understandable. So, um, you know, these studies aren't that, that purport to show intergenerational trauma, yeah. unfortunately, aren't terribly rigorous. Well, the one that rigorous. finally did me in was when I said, uh, you know, the, the theory of systemic racism as an explanation for black-white differences in income and generational wealth. That may be true, but maybe it's these other factors. And I listed those off. They said, oh, no, no, no. <laughs> We're not, we are not even going to touch this. Like, oh, great. Okay. You don't want to know what's true, right? Okay. You know, not good. All right. Did you come across the fragile families and child well-being study uh, in your research? I was, um, I was just writing about this I, in the last so. chapter in my next book, which is called Truth, What It Is, How to Find It, Why It Matters. Uh, and the last section is on unknowables, unknown, un- known unknowables, things we can't ever know. So I have God, free will and determinism and consciousness and why there's something rather than nothing. And then I added um, the last one, the unknowable, is predicting the future of human uh, behavior of an individual or society or anything like that. Uh, because, uh, because of... Um, this this concept of the uh, of a of a what is it the the branching forking garden the the garden of forking paths that's it garden of forking paths you know and the the more forks you go down the harder it is to predict in an escalating manner where you know more than five years out it, no one can predict the future these studies Phil Tetlock has studied these super forecasters even with Bayesian reasoning and statistical models and computers they cannot predict anything more than random chance five years out. You know, will Putin do this within the next six months? You know, who knows? Putin may not even know what he's going to do, right? Or predicting where the next school shooting is going to be or who's going to commit suicide. Uh, There's that example of the guy who left a note, suicide note. He said, I'm going to walk across the Golden Gate Bridge today. If somebody smiles, I will not jump. 
and he jumped. And it's like, it's so, it's so random, right? It's so hard to predict. We'll never be able to predict <laughs> the next school shooting, never. And of course, everybody would like to do this, politicians and you know, po policymakers, we have to do something about this. You can't, there's nothing you can do about it. Because how many kids threaten to kill themselves and they don't, or they feel bad and, and nothing happens, they don't shoot up the school and, and that sort of thing. Anyway, so here's the, the study. The prediction problem was poignantly exposed in a massive study in which 160 teams of social scientists were provided with detailed data collected over 15 years on 4,242 at-risk families from the Fragile Families and Child Wellbeing Study Database. They were tasked with predicting six life outcomes, for example, child GP GPA, family material hardship, parental eviction or employment, uh, and uh, others based on various causal variables such as employment, income, education, health, environment, relationship with extended kin, marriage attitudes, fatherhood, father-mother relationships, interviews, and in-home assessments. The research teams employed not only the best statistical tools and methods all social scientists are trained to use, but AI machine learning programs as well. The results were underwhelming, quoting here from the paper. Even though the Fragile Families data included thousands of variables collected to help scientists understand the lives of these families, participants were not able to make accurate predictions for the holdout cases. Further, the best submissions, which often use complex yeah. machine learning methods and had access to thousands of predictor variables, were only somewhat better than the results from a simple benchmark model that used linear regression, continuous outcomes, or logistical regression, binary outcomes, with four predictor variables selected by domain experts. Anyway, so you know, you just, this goes on. They, they just can't know. And these are the best people we have with the best statistical models. And the most you could ever say is there's a slightly greater chance that you'll have a bad outcome if you have, a, well, you have the ACE thing, right? Sexual abuse, physical abuse, neglect, emotional neglect, uh, parent not in the home, and so on. Th those are all factors that intuitively seems like they should have a negative effect. And maybe statistically, group-wise, you could see some difference. But will that person right there right. have a negative outcome? Not possible to say. And you'll you never, know. it doesn't matter how good exactly. your statistical models are, you'll never be able to know. Wow, I can't wait to read your book. That's exactly right. And why don't we know? Because human beings are amazingly resilient, and not everyone will be affected by the same things. And some people will deal with unbelievable poverty and all kinds of other, you know, difficult, you know, adverse circumstances, and they will over overcome them. And here's the thing, given that, given that we don't know the message to kids should be a positive one. You can get past that. Don't worry. You can achieve as much as the next kid. But instead, we're telling them the opposite. We're telling them that they've had trauma and they, they may have PTSD for the rest of their lives. It isn't true, yeah. and it's really counterproductive. Yeah, so solutions. Uh, so the last part of your book, you know, I guess if you're a policymaker, politician, or a, you know, a public health official, you know, and somebody says, what are you going to do? The, 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 the feeling is, well, I should do something from the top down. You know, the government should do something. We should implement some programs or like you said in, in the chapter on schools, hiring all these counselors. What was it? The state of California that hired like 10,000 counselors or something. I presume the, these yeah, are not we're, PhD we've got trained so many, and, right? and carefully <laughs> screened, right? No, no, no. And, and, and I didn't even, I didn't deal with this in the book because I, you know, I wanted to just look at the psychological harms, but you know, ever since I, I wrote the book, so many counselors and psychologists are writing to me to tell me, and you didn't even get to the fact that it's completely, you know, co-opted mm. by woke, uh, you know, racist theory and whatever. So <laughs> I didn't even deal with the politicization, which is, you know, which which we know about. But but yeah, it, what, what would I do as a policymaker? The number one thing I would do is shrink mental health staffs in schools. So instead of treating kids who don't need therapy, uh, and said, so, you know, they could just focus on the kids who may need extra support. We don't want a kid who can do math to get an accommodation for an untimed test. Why? Because he's likely to get worse at math with the accommodation he doesn't need. And we're just, we're giving, we're putting every child in a wheelchair right now. And uh, of course, there are all kinds of emotional muscles are atrophying. You know, and, and I think that's what we're seeing. I think we can absolutely turn this around, but parents have to get really involved 
And that does not mean uh, any paying for anything expensive, bringing in experts. It just means asserting your own authority and <laughs> yeah. kicking the expert out. Yeah, the I know door. It was my last five years teaching at Chapman University. Every semester, I got half a dozen letters from the school counselor or the psych department there um, in charge of this. You know, so and so is to be excused from whatever public speaking, interacting with others, needs more time on the test, right. and so on. It was like, what is going on here? And it, in my case, they they right. just did these take home essay tests yeah. based on the readings. So that didn't matter, but they all had to do a, a 18 minute TED talk, student TED talk. And this is really one of the best things most of them ever did uh, because it, you know, forced them to get up there and be organized and speak ah. in front of their, uh, their colleagues and so on. But uh, every semester I'd say, I just can't do it. I go, yes, you can. You can do it. This is going to be epic. When you do this, you're going to be, no, I can't. Yes, you can. I'm going to work with you. And they all did it all the, uh, the very last semester last year. Uh, this, this frail little girl. Oh my God. I thought she was just going to die. I mean, it was. I felt so bad for her, and I was like, come on, we can do this. You can just do it in front of me after class, and we'll rehearse. Uh, oh, no, I can't even do it in front of you. And she was just, like, shaking. I'm like, all right, all right, I'll have you just do a term paper. I just didn't want to destroy this poor kid. But how do they get like that? I don't know, her particular case. But, yeah, right. that's an example of what you're talking about. That's exactly right. I mean, what they need is coaching. They need people who say, you can do it, do it, you know, get up there. Instead, they're getting, uh, uh, you know, letters from the time they are five years old on, you know, the time they start school. And the, the, the counselors are saying, don't call on this child because of her social anxiety. Well, everyone who has even any experience with, you know, ang you know studying anxiety mm -hmm. knows that that's counterproductive. You want to expose a kid to the things that make her uncomfortable, not let her retreat further from them. And that's what we're seeing. We're seeing a generation that doesn't feel up to life because the mental health staffs went in there and they gave them accommodations they didn't need, therapy they didn't need that was counterproductive, and medications yeah. that are not doing them, them any the Jerry good. I would tell the Seinfeld riff about uh, how people are more afraid of public speaking than they are of dying. <laughs> and he says, so if you go to our funeral, <laughs> you'd rather be the corpse than the eulogist. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that kind of breaks things up a little that's bit. Amazing. I said, so if I you feel a little that. anxious before your TED talk, good. That that's how you're supposed to feel. That's normal. You know, I've given thousands of talks, and I still get nervous before everyone, or at least a little. You're, you know, if you don't feel a little anxious or something, it means you're not excited, or you're not involved, or you're not. You don't care. That's right. And when we delete those feelings, then the natural evolutionary benefits of things like anxiety in children, because the parents are so frantic, they think they need to get in there with medication and delete it. We, they do it without even ever being told what the benefits of anxiety are. Like, as you said, performance tends to improve with anxiety, right? Awareness of danger. We look both ways when we cross the street because of a certain amount of anxiety. And, you know, if you if you get in there with medication and delete our body's natural adaptive resources, uh, the kids may never learn to cope. Yeah, it's just so distracting. And, you know, reading your chapter in the book of what they're doing in these classrooms, what happened to teaching algebra <laughs> or just reading or English? I mean, what are these teachers right. doing at these schools? It's astonishing. Right. That's exactly right. And instead of giving them a skill or something they can go out and do and feel good about, we're obsessing over their feelings and they're understandably feeling worse. And what you just said is right. When I wrote the last book, you know, the thing that parents m might not realize is that nearly every one of those girls, those teenagers who decided suddenly she had a trans identity, um, that was very much with a therapist. That, that these girls tended to make that decision. And it wasn't a gender therapist, usually. It was just a generic psychodynamic mm -hmm. psychotherapist who was talking to the girl about her feelings or her problems or her trauma. And when they were done talking about mom, mm -hmm. they moved on to gender. I think it's a form of dualism, a Cartesian dualism, like with multiple personality disorder, now disassociative uh, something disorder, DID. This is this just crazy notion that there's you your body. And then there's this other thing that's floating around in there. And maybe there's two of them, you know, maybe there's three of them, you know, the three faces of Eve and civil, you know, these all turned out to be just bogus if in, in some cases, fraudulent, just people making up stories to write a book. Uh, but it caught on and, and even therapists, trained therapists, they just bought into this dualism. You know, you're, you know, you, Abigail, you're a female, but it's not like there's a female body and then there's this female soul floating around in there. 
You just are. There's no, there's no your inner child female. There's just you. That's right. And you know, you mentioned the dualism. That's exactly right. I love that because the Cartesian dualism, because that's why we don't realize that things like exercise is really, really good for the mind because we're all connected. Right. And it turns out that regular exercise does more, you know, yeah, dancing yeah. <laughs> does more for mild to moderate depression than, than psychotherapy or, or psych meds. Uh, cause we, because we are <laughs> Did you one see my thing, tweet about that? I, said. I, I listened to your book while I was out riding. I said, I felt so much better after <laughs> being depressed, <laughs> Re reading out of the book, but I went for a ride. Now I'm happy. <laughs> but, 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 but what is the, <laughs> what, what, so what do we know about SSRIs? Yeah. Uh, are they really no better than exercise or, or are they helpful for some people who suffer extreme depression or is it, what do we know? It's a good question. I don't think we know about why they work. They seem to depress, you know, they seem to, in many people, sort of put a cap on how low your emotions can go, but they also can put a cap on how good you can feel, too. So we don't hmm. exactly know. They're, they seem to be a fairly crude mechanism. They come with a lot of side effects. And, you know, most importantly, in children who or adolescents who can't say, you know, really, I miss having a sex drive, they're not in a position to evaluate the changes the hmm. way an adult can so you see these kids put on, they have some side effects and they get put on more psych meds. And now they're, they're walking around in this giant snowsuit mm -hmm. emotionally. And it's, it, it seems to not be doing a lot of good. We know that suicide, suicidal ideation is a side effect of these medications for reasons we don't understand mm -hmm. in adolescence. Yeah. At the beginning of your book, you have that um, cautionary tale of there are people that have severe mental illness or depression or whatever. Well, I'm not talking about those people. So I guess it's a question of quantity at some point becomes a qualitative difference. Um, it, and maybe it's a subjective definition. Like, like, do you have an addiction? Well, if your spouse leaves you and you get fired <laughs> from your job and you're homeless, you have a problem, whatever it is, gambling or <laughs> sex or drugs or whatever. If you right. don't, if you function all right, well, then maybe you don't. So maybe it's something like that with depression. Everybody feels sad or once in a while. But if you're so depressed, you, you you can't even get out of bed to go to work, and you so you lose your job. That would mean, you know, maybe we need to try something. Totally. And what, what the problem is with teenagers, they don't know a lot of what mm. they're feeling is normal. They don't know it. See, an adult can say, man, I, you know, I've had, you know, periods of sadness before, but this is worse. I can't even get out of bed. That's different. With a teenager, they're so tumultuous mm. anyway in terms of, and they don't have any perspective on it. And that's the problem. You start them down, then the road of SSRs, they may never gain perspective yeah. on it. Yeah. I've listened to most of the podcasts you did on this book. Uh, Rogan asked you, and you were on the day before your book even came out, you know, what, what's been the response? Well, it, the book it, it was not even out yet. So now here we are a month out. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what have you heard from parents or therapists or have, has anybody written said, hey, 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 no, there are good therapists and I'm one of them and I'm different from the bad therapist or whatever. Okay, most people are, I'm shocked by this, but are in, oh, there's been overwhelming mm. agreement. So in other words, so many therapists want to tell me how bad their colleagues are and um, certainly psychologists, they want to tell me, they said they've been worried about this forever and they're glad a journalist wrote about this because they, did, they didn't want to say anything about their colleagues, but they think it's a really? mess, you know, all this overdiagnosis. And then adults want to tell me, uh, the number of adults who tell me I spent 10 years in therapy and I don't Whoa, think it improved any years. of my problems. Whoa. You know, people will tell me, to, someone the other day told me 25 Whoa. years. They, they just, uh, nobody's measuring, right. nobody's tracking. It, are, are the problems I came here for, are right. they getting better? I knew a, uh, a, a, um, a, me a mentalist who was also a magician, but he also worked for the Psychic Friends Network back in the 90s uh, be because it, you know, it. it yeah. paid better than being a magician. You know, they, they all want to uh, right. be Penn and Teller in, in Vegas with their own show, but <laughs> few, many are called, few are chosen, right? So, you know, he was working the, and he got, it was like four bucks a minute that the company charged and he got like half of that. A minute, right? So, I mean, it was a pretty good thing. I, so, anyway, I asked him, why are these people calling you? And he said, mostly they just want somebody to talk to. Nights and weekends is when they would call. They just need somebody to talk to. And it's like, yeah, but you're not a therapist. And he goes, oh, I know, but, you know, we're just chatting, you know, love life and work and 
health, and just, you know, basically the four areas that people are interested, love, health, money, and career. And he said, I could keep them on for hours just going through it. So tell me about your mother. <laughs> it's, like, <laughs> it's hilarious. And then uh, uh, the the company, got, I think they got shut down and they went out of business. And none of the psychics saw that coming, by the way, which is kind of funny. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but it was that. like a crocodile Dundee. Remember that scene where she's explaining, he goes to New York and she's explaining all her friends are, are seeing therapists. And he says, why? Well, you know, they have trouble and problems and they need somebody to talk to. He says, in Australia, we have friends. <laughs> 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 yeah. That's amazing. Cause the truth is there's no question. Look for children, especially there's no question who it's better for them to talk to. If what they're feeling is a little blue or a little down, talking to someone who really cares about them, even a teacher, you know, anyone, but an aunt, an uncle, a grandparent, a, you know, a friend, that, that'll do, you know, at least they're not incentivized. Nobody, those adults aren't incentivized to keep them coming back regularly on Tuesdays to talk about their sadness which can be a really yeah. bad pattern. You mentioned Goodwill Hunting in your book. I love that movie. It's so well written and acted. And But, the, but that yeah. scene where... Uh, at, you know, where, where they have the breakthrough where Robin Williams says, you know, it's not your, it's not your fault, son, that, you know, he was sexually abused as a child and Robin Williams was too. And they exchanged their horror stories and he's, you know, it's not your fault. I know, I know. Don't pull that shit on me. It's not your fault, son. It's not your fault. Finally, they embrace and they cry and then, and then he's off. Like that was the moment. From what you right. know, is, is that possible or is that just a Hollywood story? So from what I understand, that's a Hollywood story. And I didn't know that when I started, but I actually was able to talk to people who worked with uh, adults. Uh, there's a, one physician of um, mental health who work, does works in the area of mental health in England, and he works with ex-convicts in Plymouth, England. And he said, you know, some people aren't helped by talking about what they went through, first of all. And second of all, so they, they would only be re-traumatized by it. And um, so they don't need it and they can stand to harm. They, they, they stand to be further harmed by talking about what they went through. Actually, very often they know what they need. They want to move on and helping them deal with life in the, in, in the here and now is much better than rehashing what yeah. they went through with them. That can be more injurious. And we have this fantasy that everybody needs to talk about their problems. They can't feel better until they talk about their problems. They need to discourage their problems not true. The research doesn't back it up. And most people, if you give them a healthy life, if you surround them with those things we call friends and family and, and sense of purpose and, and sense of productivity in the world and, and capacity in the world, they'll do much better mm. uh, than sending them down, you know, especially as kids talking about their problems. Once remember a the week. comedian Drew Carey or the, the black glasses? Yeah. You know, there was a story yeah. that came out that he was sexually abused as a child. I forget exactly how it came out, but he's like, yeah, yeah, that that happened. And everybody in Hollywood, well, let's talk about it. You know, let's interview you and let's t talk about it. And he's like, I don't want to talk about it. It, it happened. I, of course, it wasn't good, but fuck it. I'm just, I'm just going forward. And they're like, no, no, no. We have to talk about this. Oh, my God, you were sexually abused. As a child. He's like, yeah, it happened. Whatever. And the same thing happened to Richard Dawkins at the end of, I think it was the God delusion. He mentions like he went to this, um, a, you know, exclusive is Eaton or one of these exclusive British uh, schools where the, one of the school teachers or whatever, it, the, these were boarding schools. So he's staying the night there. And so they, there was some of this kind of little fondling stuff with the boys and it wasn't clear how far it went, but far enough that it would, you know, we would say that's sexual assault. And he's like, yep, yeah, it happened, but whatever. I, it didn't bother me. It didn't really affect me. I it, it prefer it didn't happen, but, you know, whatever. And and people, in, well, in the atheist community where he's a huge hero, is like, no, this has to be a huge thing. We have to talk about this. He's like, no, we don't. Uh, it didn't really affect me. It had to have affected you. <laughs> and, you know, again, this is part of that kind of psychic dualism. That, but there's something inside you, like, like the unconscious racism. Right. It's in there. You just don't know that it's in there. You are a racist. No, I'm not. Yes, you are. You just don't know you're a racist, same kind of thing, right? And we can tease this out through these kind of trick psychology things where we do the time and you have to press this button and that button when you see these images. Aha, we ferreted out the inner racist. This, this, uh, th th this test that supposedly shows this is bogus. Again, more bad psychology. 
Yeah, I mean, it's it's crazy that we think that the only way to be compassionate to someone who desperately wants to and wants and feels they would be helped by talking about something you know traumatic that they went through is by forcing everyone to rehash mm. their pain. And we there's no good evidence that it's necessary um, for in order to get beyond um, you know most of the things traumatic, even traumatic events. I mean, they. I, the number, if you look at the number of women who were at some point, you know, you know, sexually, what would count as sexually assaulted is very high. And it's not that they are all going around with this huge injury that they're not admitting to. Actually, you know, we don't like to talk about this, but most of them do recover and live, hold down jobs, form families, you know, hold down relationships uh, and are productive citizens. And the idea that they're they're somehow hobbled by it, um, most of them won't right. be and aren't and and we shouldn't presume right yeah during the, the height of the me too movement my wife was telling me yeah of course i've been pinched and poked and touched and every woman has it's just i mean honestly who hasn't? Just, yeah <laughs> i'm not a snowflake i'm just I'm not gonna let it bother me it's like oh okay then why is it yeah. that some are tra traumatized i guess that's the question and some of it is self-inflicted as you said through these kind of bad therapy yeah, I mean, people are going to have different reactions, especially if they've been told they've been sexually assaulted, right? If they told, if they were told um, that what they went through was traumatic and was constituted sexual assault, I think it will be harder for them to put behind them. Now, that doesn't mean it's not ever necessary to name what happened in that way, or you know, but but you know, in the main, we don't want to go around labeling things as trauma if a person is naturally recovering especially yeah. if they're a kid. Well, that part of your book too also reminded me of the, the uh, during the Me Too movement when all these colleges and universities launched their own little tribunal uh, court cases with these uh, uh, students who were accused of uh, sexual assault. You know, did you call the police? Oh, no. Are we going to take this to court? Oh, no, no. We have the three deans and they're going to launch their own investigation. Are you really sure? And finally, some of the parents stepped in and said, we have a lawyer and you're not doing this to our son. You know, he get because some of them, they'd bring, they'd haul the guy in. You can't have a lawyer with you and we're going to interrogate you about what you did. Usually it's these, you know, couples that hook up at one of these kegger uh, where everybody's just shit faced and then. People fuck around, and then the next day, like, oh, I really shouldn't have done that. And instead of saying, well, I'm not going to do that again, <laughs> they, you know, they go, oh, in that case, we're going to, you know, make a big thing about it here on campus, right? I think that's largely starting to turn around now because of the legal uh, ramifications for colleges to do that. Yeah, I, I mean, I, you, there's that's susceptible to all the same problems, right? The moment that you bring in these authorities, you start, you have this power of suggestion. And um, yeah, I, I mean, the lack of due process in universities has been a huge problem yeah. for a long time. All right. So um, on the general larger picture of, you know, the kind of craziness and, and all this politicization of stuff, you know, my wife keeps asking me, you know, when is this going to turn around? Because I keep telling her the pendulum is about to swing. And I've been telling her this for like five years now. <laughs> you know, all of it. It's just gotten crazy. Right. My sense is it depends what we're talking about. So the issues that I write about, the demoralization, the, the generation convinced it's ill, uh, that it's somehow mentally ill because it, you know, is gets nervous before exams. So therefore has, you know, testing anxiety mm. and all this stuff that parents can absolutely turn around. Absolutely. I can make them, you know, I tr tried to in the book, make them more aware that, you know, psychotherapy can cause harms to kids, med psychiatric medication can cause harms to kids, social emotional learning, all that. Okay. That parents, I think is very easy to turn around. The, the, the bigger problems is that, you know, we have an ideologically committed group of people in our country and the question will be, are we more committed to our way of life or are they to theirs? It's really going to be a contest of who is more willing to defend its values. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's just it, it's harder. Everyone wants to do it through legislation, which is a very blunt tool for regulating medicine. Yeah. I did wonder about some of these therapists you write about. To what extent are they projecting themselves onto these students? Like, I, I'm not sure what I, my problems are. I have all these problems. And if I diagnose this with a bunch of other people, then I'm not a standout. This is normal. You know, honestly, some some people, therapists, were very open about that, how, 
like a lot of their colleagues seem to have a lot <laughs> yes, of personal problems. I <laughs> but <laughs> I would just say it's like the parenting experts. I don't believe anybody's a parenting expert until you meet their adult mm. children. Okay. You know, it's like, I'm not a parenting expert. I always tell people that my kids are young. Who knows how they'll turn out. I'm hoping for the best, but I am no parenting expert. And I feel that about parenting experts in general. You know, you see these women out there giving advice. They have a, they have a five-year-old and a seven-year-old. I don't know what's going to be with those kids. Don't take advice from that mm -hmm. person. <laughs> yeah. Right. <They're laughs> really, I mean, there's tons of parenting books, but, but these are so faddish for the last century. You right. know, you're, you, right. you should be super loving and hugging. No, you should be cold and disciplinary. But, but there is some research on this, right? Authoritarian, what is not authoritarian versus authoritative. authoritative. Yes. Yeah. You want to be authoritative. That is He's have rules and enforce them, but don't be authoritarian and don't be super loose. Right. Be loving, but rule bound. Right. Those, those parents do the best. They produce the happiest kids, least depression, least anxiety, most successful. And ultimately they have the best relationship with their parents. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. My wife's from Germany. She's a good disciplinarian with love. <laughs> I'm a pushover. Yeah. <laughs> Whenever my little guy gets upset, I take him to Target to get a new toy. <laughs> She's like, don't do that. I'm like, oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> I'm the worst. <laughs> no, immigrants tend to be much better about this than that American right? born. That's really funny. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, immigrants are the first people who always told me, you know, I I Americans, they have no authority with their own children. And <laughs> I thought, you know, there's something to that. Well, Abigail, I'd say you're doing God's work, except I don't believe in oh, God. <laughs> so right. you're, doing, you're doing the work of, uh, of the angels or something. No. You know, your Thank first you. book was published by Regnery, right? Yes. Right. So that's kind of a conservative religious publisher. This book is, is uh, Sentinel, which is Simon & Schuster, right? Penguin Random oh, Penguin House. Random yeah. House, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, it's <laughs> So okay. you've really gone mainstream. I think that's interesting and telling because I was always worried that your work would be labeled as a conservative or religious position. And it's not. It shouldn't be, right? You know what's crazy? When I wrote Irreversible Damage, it was not published by a conservative publisher in the, in the UK. It was just a regular publisher mm. because in the UK, they didn't regard it as a conservative issue. Really? In America, it became a conservative issue for no good reason. Right. Right. It was never a political issue. It was a medical issue. But um, that was the only one that, you know, was interested in publishing me. Um, so that's what I went with. I wasn't going to, you know, there were other journalists who thought about it and thought, oh, I don't want to be with a conservative or religious publisher, but I, I wanted to get the message out. So I was, you know, very happy to work with Regnery and they were wonderful to me. And, um, and this time again, uh, you know, I'm looking into the harms to children and, you know, this time caused by the mental health profession. And, uh, uh, with this one, it was less politicized. So I, I guess, uh, publishers really, were not, every no parent one. should read this book. I mean, there are no good parenting books. Okay. But this is, this is as close as you're going to get. All right. What's next on your research writing, uh, plate? It's a good question. I don't yet know, mm. but, uh, you know, the last two books have been on the rising generation and, and they definitely fascinate me. I have three kids I'm raising in the rising generation. So, uh, you know, we'll oh, see. Right. If, if it's, That's right. Uh, you have twin boys, right? I do. Yeah. Okay. So there's your experiment. <laughs> see, <laughs> exactly. You, you have an N of two. <laughs> see how that goes compared to their sister. Exactly. The sister's older. I forget. <laughs> Younger, Younger. okay, right, yeah, that's yeah. right, <laughs> all right, well, congratulations to you on the book, and Thanks, for letting yeah. your kid take the, what is it, the bus or the subway, no, yeah. we don't have subways in LA. <laughs> yeah, they, they walk home from school. Yeah, I like that you said that was the hardest thing you ever, uh, of course, of course it is, I would hate it too, <laughs> yeah. but anyway, all right, thanks, Abigail. Thank you.